Exploring the backcountry by airplane is a fun and rewarding experience. Not only does it give you the opportunity to use your plane for a purpose other than the $100 hamburger, but it allows you to camp and explore in areas that are difficult or simply impossible to access by other means of transportation. Many of these strips are somewhat short, possibly rough, or in confined areas that require non-standard approaches. They are also spectacular when you get there, allowing you to enjoy a remote area vastly different than the normal Sunday afternoon flight. A different skill set is usually required compared to the 4,000 foot paved runway that most general aviation pilots are used to. Whether you are landing at a 200 foot sandbar or a more benign strip, the ability to consistently and accurately hit your spot is a necessary skill in the backcountry environment. The reality is, before heading here, or trying something like this, regardless of whether you fly a Carbon Cub, Husky, Maul, or Nose Dragger, before you have to worry about the size of your tires, or the length of your prop, you have to be able to consistently hit your touchdown mark with absolute confidence. This kind of training doesn't start out in the backcountry, but rather a dirt or grass, public or private strip that isn't sensitive to noise or repeated touch and goes. Much like in the turban world, the shortest landings are preceded by a precise, stabilized approach. Unlike the turbans, we don't have ref speeds, complicated charts, or angle of attack indicators. Instead, we rely on attitude flying for a steep and stable approach. If you remember back to your primary days, you might recall this chart. It is your lift over drag ratio. In order to fly steep, stable approaches, we fly on the back side of the drag curve with lots of induced drag. However, we don't use engine power as our primary energy source. Instead, you are really relying on gravity with minor stabs of throttle to maintain our imaginary glide slope. We teach this using the horizon and the wing. By using some more cheesy animation, we will illustrate the angle between the wing and the horizon. While this angle is different in each aircraft, the best way to describe it is slightly aft of flat or just a little nose up from parallel with the horizon. The following video is of a Mall M7-260. This particular model was equipped with an angle of attack indicator. While it was interesting to go out and fly these approaches with it, it wasn't the primary instrument for this exercise. The main takeaway from this video should be the angle of the wing with the horizon, the steep approach, and the stable airspeed. We did this at multiple different weights. From a gross weight to a low weight, there was an eight knot difference at the exact wing angle. This kind of flying is using one of the oldest cliches in aviation. Pitch for airspeed, power for altitude. Listen to the minor power changes while the airspeed remains static. Most people aren't comfortable hearing the stall horn this early in the approach, and yes, it is annoying. This works well because you are using gravity and potential energy from your altitude as your energy source instead of your engine. A lot of your energy is vertical instead of horizontal, which gets largely dissipated in a brief flare. You should notice there isn't really a round out or bleed off of airspeed towards the bottom of the approach, but rather a quick flare with a shot of power. This is a much more common attitude that we see with most general aviation pilots. Look at the angle between the wing and the horizon. This attitude is a combination of respecting the stall spin scenario and the often taught method of different airspeeds for the approach, 80, 70, 60. This nose down attitude yields too much forward energy requiring the pilot to have to bleed off their airspeed in a round out before the flare. In either event, a healthy margin of approach speed versus stall speed is maintained. This usually results in an inconsistent touchdown point since it is hard to predict the precise spot where the aircraft will no longer be flying. 
If you look at the airspeed, it is around 60 knots. This is a very common final approach speed, regardless of weight, type of plane, flap configuration, or length of runway that I've seen from students. It works fine if you have plenty of runway, but it is simply too much energy for the backcountry environment. Not only does it make it harder to hit your touchdown spot, but also makes for a longer rollout. It is crucial to point out that this is not a high powered approach where we are dragging it in. While there are scenarios where this is necessary, it has too much reliance on the engine, it is harder to see where you are going, and it exacerbates all of the left hand turning tendencies. Take this debacle for instance. Here's a high powered approach while attempting to adjust to a dog leg in the runway. I essentially stall it in while completely cross controlled. I don't know how close the wing was to hitting the ground, but I know that it was close enough to not to want to do it again. The beautiful thing about this type of approach is that it is easy to visualize, and with a lot of practice it is easy to execute. It is applicable in everything from a Stinson and Pacer to a 185 or a Cub. Its slow airspeed gives you time to think, and because of its tight turn radius and steep glide slope, you are often able to sneak into areas that are sometimes thought of as one way or simply not landable. Whether it is being able to land into the wind or away from the sun or have the possibility of a go around, having a variety of options in the backcountry is always the safest way to operate. Make sure to check out our next video, The Takeoff.